Bibles with you, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. This is the first of the seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. This is Western Turkey, by the way, today, just as a frame of reference. And the first letter is to the church in Ephesus. If, if you look at the situations of the churches, these seven churches in Asia Minor, it really is amazing how similar they are to the situations and circumstances of churches in the West today and have always been, if you're aware of the things that are going on. It's, it's much the same today. There's nothing new under the sun as it has been over all of church history. Laodicea, uh, the, the lukewarm church that we'll get to, this was a very affluent community. Christians were tempted to uh, pursue personal peace, to pursue a comfortable lifestyle. They had the means to do it. They relied on their financial resources. Um, the churches in Pergamum and Thyatira, they're stained by the scandal of sexual immorality in their communities. The church in Smyrna was stigmatized by outsiders. All seven cities uh, in Asia Minor worshiped the emperor of Rome. They had no choice in that, but that's what they did, and most of them wanted to. Uh, Sardis was, um, or I take, I guess, Pergamum and Thyatira uh, were uncertain where to draw the line with the gospel as they tried to connect with culture. Uh, Sardis was a church of all image and no substance despite all their programs. They didn't have any depth. Um, they lacked spiritual life. Philadelphia, the church in Philadelphia was this tiny minority struggling to hold on in a community that just despised them. So if you look at these churches and look at the world today, it's amazing how churches in different places are suffering under the same circumstances. The church we look at tonight, the first letter to the church in Ephesus was marked by known for strong doctrine. These were orthodox, biblical people filled with theologians. Everybody's a theologian. Everybody has thoughts about God, but these were learned people. They studied the scriptures. They knew them well. Jesus praises them for this. This is part of their commendation. They were orthodox. They had discernment. They could discern between truth and error, between faithfulness and compromise. But in spite of that, somewhere along the line, in their pursuit of doctrinal precision and integrity, they had forgotten how to love sinners. They had forgotten, they had stopped loving imperfect people, which is so different from how the church in Ephesus began. So you have seven churches that are so different from each other in so many ways, and yet so similar in so many ways to the issues facing the church where we live and the places in which we serve Jesus today. The seven letters to the churches reveal what every church needs at all times in every place to stand against the onslaught of the enemy, to wisen us to the schemes of the enemy and to remain faithful to God and compassionate toward others, even towards our enemies. They needed, we need to hear the voice of Jesus Christ, the one who speaks to the churches. It's only the voice of Jesus that speaks peace to our hearts whose diagnosis of our need is always correct, who can conquer our self-destructive love of this world and make us conquerors in these last days. These letters are what his spirit says to the seven churches in Asia and to all the churches in all times and places. The will of Jesus for us is not only to endure the last days, but to conquer the last days. Jesus commended the church in Ephesus for its doctrinal and spiritual integrity but held against it, their abandonment of the love they once had for people. He called them to repent, return to these works. That's how we know what he's talking about. Or he would come and remove their lampstand. If they do this, he would grant them to eat from the tree of life in the paradise of God. In our pursuit, and we should pursue it, of doctrinal and spiritual integrity in the midst of an unbelieving and increasingly immoral and hostile culture, we at Moundsville Baptist Church, not concerned about other churches nearly as much as I am for us, we must not ignore the voice of Jesus who commands us to love both our neighbors and our enemies. 
This is the first way the church conquers in the last days. We conquer the temptation to stop loving people even in the midst of their rampant wickedness. So let's pray and we'll look at the passage together. Father, I ask you to keep my mind clear tonight of anything that would interrupt the preaching of this text for your name's sake and for your people. Please keep my head clear. Fill me with your spirit. Hold me up, Father. Help me to focus. Help everyone to hear, to understand, Father, and to believe. Help us be conformed to the image of Christ together more and more for the glory of your Son and the good of the people in the Ohio Valley and beyond to West Virginia, America, and the world, Father, as you see fit. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me read the first seven verses of Revelation 2. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary but I have this against you. Imagine hearing that. So remember the recipients in Ephesus, they didn't have a Bible to refer to. They're getting a letter. The elders are reading it. One of the elders is reading it. And this is what they hear. Jesus says, I have something against you that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So just for our first letter here, all seven of these letters follow the same basic template. You have the same eight elements that are common to all seven of them. You have the address, the command to write, the identification of the speaker, the description of the church's situation, a call to repentance or ongoing faithfulness, a summons to hear, and a promise to the victor or the conqueror. So that form, John is writing Revelation, these letters as though they're royal edicts to these churches, telling the churches, remember, Jesus is your king, in contrast to Rome, in contrast to even the evil one to Satan. Jesus is the true king. He's a king. Jesus identifies himself as we go through these seven letters to each church based on that congregation's unique struggle. So how Jesus identifies himself is what the church needs reminded of in its relation to who Jesus is. This is what they're forgetting about him. In Ephesus, he's the Lord of the church. He rules over the church. The description of the situation in each of the seven is the heart of each letter. You have that repetitive summons to listen. He who has ears to hear. That's the refrain of Jesus. Remember how often he said this. It functions with the same intent that thus saith the Lord functioned in the Old Testament. We would read it so much from the prophets. The point of it when he says that is you're meant to hear this and respond to it. The Lord is speaking to you. So Ephesus is most likely the first letter because it was only 50 miles from Patmos. If a courier was traveling away from the island with the letters, that's the first place they'd hit is Ephesus. Then he'd head north to uh, Smyrna. Then next he'd head a little further north to Pergamum and so on. So the order of the letters is how the courier would have delivered them. Ephesus was a huge city by first century standards, about 250,000 people roughly. Again, in the first century, that was a massively gigantic city. They were required, as every Roman city was, every Roman province was, to worship the emperor as God. Uh, I heard one commentator, we build presidential libraries, right, in honor of presidents, or we name streets and things like that. In Ephesus, as in all the cities of the Roman Empire, temples were built to honor the emperor, to worship him as God, as a deity. That was required by law, or you were punished, So that was what they were up against, as all the churches were up against. And I can't cite the quote exactly. I heard someone say it. I don't know where it's from. But Ephesus was a seething cauldron of countless cults and superstitions. Very spiritualistic, right? Very 
spiritualistic. The magical arts were prevalent in Ephesus. We find that out right away in Acts 19 when we're first introduced to them in their worship of the goddess Diana or the goddess Artemis in um, the Roman language, I believe. That temple, the temple of Diana was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a magnificent structure. Prisa and Aquila, if you remember them from Acts, they're the ones that brought Christianity initially to Ephesus around 52 AD. Paul came through shortly thereafter, um, ministered with them, then left them there. He came back and spent about two and a half years there in total ministering. It was not a remotely Christian city when they found it. It was pagan to the core. There were no laws. This is important, beloved. There were no laws, zero, to protect the freedoms of Christians or any other religion for that matter, but there weren't really any other options in Rome at the time. There were no laws to protect them. The worship of false deities was institutionalized. It was the law. We have come to so desperately depend on, as Americans, political support, political blessings, economic liberties, legal protections. We're so dependent on those things. Those things are so much a part of our DNA that we think if they're absent, a church can't exist. We wouldn't know how to function if all of those protections and legalities were taken away from us. We wouldn't know what to do. If those things are gone, if there aren't economic liberties, civil protections of religious freedom, the church would be gone too. That's a large part of our thinking. But the church in Ephesus, remember, had none of these blessings, none of them. And they're a rock of the truth in Ephesus. They had none of these protective measures in place. They had no constitution, no bill of rights, no first amendment. They had no right to vote, nothing. And they not only survived in Ephesus, they thrived. They thrived in a place like this. And beloved, I can't help but wonder if that's why they thrived. Because all they could depend on was Jesus. They had nothing else at all to lean on in order to stand and in order to endure. And beloved, the church has always needed, in America maybe now more than in our past, the church has always needed to be prepared to survive and thrive in a context like this. This is what's normal for Christianity in the world and the church in the world. America is not normal. We're very fortunate here. But this is not normal. Jesus introduces himself in verse 1 as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands in chapter 1, verse 20. Remember, Jesus wants them to know he's among them. He holds the church in his hand and walks among them. He's sovereign over them, and he's aware of everything going on in them. Everything. He owns, operates, and governs every single branch of his church. He owns, operates, and governs Moundsville Baptist Church. Nobody will disagree with this verbally, but this is not a slogan. This is a reality. Jesus owns and operates and governs Moundsville Baptist Church. He walks among the church. That's what he's telling Ephesus. I know what's going on. I'm there. I'm always present. And he doesn't walk among us like a sheriff, right? He's not trying to bring the hammer down every time we slip up. Jesus walks among the church to nurture and grow what he has planted, whom he has put on mission, what he wants to be conformed to his image. He's never absent. Jesus is never absent from his church. He's never unaware of what happens here. He's present at every gathering. He sits with us at every meal together. Jesus attends every meeting every single one of them. He is aware of every sin we commit, every song we sing, every word we say, every sermon that is preached. He's over every decision. He knows how and why the decisions we make are made. He is here. He walks among this lampstand. Imagine if we operated on a daily basis with the awareness that Christ is among us, how that might transform who we are and what we do. And in verses two and three, he says, I know, I know your works. Verse three, I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. He knows everything. I know your works. He knows everything we're doing. 
He's aware of everything. It's, it's hard sometimes when the things you do to help your brothers and sisters and the church family are largely overlooked. People don't even know they're happening. But the people that hand out bulletins, the people that help clean up, the people that serve dinners and all these things, people may not always recognize those things. Jesus is aware of all of them, all of them, all the time. He knows. Think about the implications of that for how we operate as a church, how any church operates. Secrecy, underhandedness in a church, quiet whispers, groups strategizing to get their way and make sure their interests are protected and maintained, that goes against the spirit of Jesus. It's so antichrist, it acts like he's not here. Like you can actually say things and try to get your way and he's not aware of it, that he isn't among us. So let's do this in secret. Secrecy is where the enemy plays in a church. The places where the church is trying to keep Jesus out and pretend he isn't there. And in every church I've ever been in, every church anybody has ever been in, secrecy is a part of the game. If, if something isn't going your way and you're afraid that it might go against your interests, you gather a contingency and you work and you, you dig and you talk and you make moves here and there so that we'll do this and then they won't be able to do that. And then, beloved, do you think Jesus isn't aware of this? You can bowl me over. It's not very hard. You can slip things by me. I don't even, not Jesus. Do you see what's at issue here? When we're acting, if, if we act like this, we're talking about whether or not we recognize the presence of Jesus among us. Like as we're gathering and, and you can see it on people's faces when they're talking. After church, all that. Look, he's standing right there. He's standing right there. Aware of all of it. Secrecy in a church. Anything that acts as if Jesus isn't here or isn't aware is the spirit of Antichrist. All right, we're waiting on a big figure. John says the Antichrists have always been among us. He commends Ephesus. Jesus commends Ephesus for their discernment. And if discernment between truth and error was needed anywhere, it was a city like Ephesus. In Acts chapter 20, verse 30, you remember Paul called the elders to himself from the Ephesian churches at Miletus to speak to them. He exhorted the elders of the churches to exercise discernment because from among their own selves, men would arise speaking evil things to pull people away from the truth. Later, Paul left Timothy, his right-hand man in Ephesus in 1 Timothy 1, 3 and 4. And apparently by this time, the 90s AD or so, this has borne good fruit as far as their integrity and doctrinal precision is concerned. Ephesus refused to tolerate false teachers. Jesus did not tolerate and will not tolerate those who poison his church through error or through false teaching and temptation. They're enduring patiently. They haven't grown weary. They're committed to the truth. So first Jesus commends them for their discernment their work and their endurance, their unwillingness to tolerate evil in their midst. Also, if you look down in verse six, another commendation, yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Who were the Nicolaitans? It's, it's very hard to identify exactly who this group was, but the book of Revelation gives us you know, a, a glimpse into who this group was. Later, we'll see in the letter to Pergamum, the church in Pergamum, the Nicolaitans there are compared there to Balaam. If you remember the prophet Balaam who failed to pronounce a curse against Israel. He wouldn't do it. But later he recommended a different strategy to his employer, Balak, the king of Moab, to defeat God's people. Let's lure them into sexual immorality and into idolatry. Let's use the ladies among us, just very nice guys. Let's use the ladies among us to lure the Israelites into sexual immorality. Then they'll curse themselves by sinning. We'll lure them into that. The Nicolaitans are compared to that because apparently this was a group that used the same strategy to threaten the churches in these letters in all of Asia Minor, apparently, because they were known everywhere. But they're also an issue in Ephesus. The church in Ephesus hated the things the Nicolaitans were doing. They were onto them. They knew who they were and what they were trying to do. And Jesus shared that hatred. Jesus hates anything that poisons his church and sickens the water. 
They're willing to endure tribulations. They're not willing to endure compromise. So that means the letters will tell you what's going on. Idolatry and immorality were not the problem in Ephesus. When he talks about their first love, the love they had at first, it's not that now they love something else. They love something other than Jesus. Their love for him that they had in the beginning has been compromised by idolatry or immorality. Look at four and five. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Where have we fallen? Repent and do the works you did at first. And the book of Acts tells us the works the Ephesus church did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So not only does Jesus know their works in two and three, in four and five, he knows their hearts. He knows their affections. It is impossible to fool Jesus. Impossible. Your theology is correct, he's saying, in essence, to the church, and that glorifies me but I've got something against you. So beloved, before we even dig into that, to be correct in our doctrine is not enough for the commendation of Jesus. It's not enough. We could be as right as it's possible to be in our doctrine. That's why I study, that's why we care about the word, that's why we preach the word. We can have that. We can be right and correct in our doctrine to the point that Jesus would commend us for our accuracy. So good doctrine, sound doctrine, right doctrine is never less than necessary, Sam Storm says, but sometimes it's not enough. It's never less than necessary, but sometimes it's not enough. In their quest, their pursuit of right doctrine, they had become unloving of other people. They had stopped serving and doing works like they did in the beginning for other people, for their community. Again, the love they had at first is not the love they have for Jesus. This rebuke doesn't read like that kind of rebuke. We read rebukes like that in scripture. Jeremiah 2, 4 through 13 identifies that as the issue. You've basically uh, forsaken God's love and hewed out for yourselves broken cisterns. They aren't in love with something else like idols. They haven't been compromised like that. No, they'd fallen out of love with other people, the people in their community. Again, Ephesus at the beginning in Acts chapter 19, it was, there was a riot because of the witness of Christ, because the, the silversmiths that made the little statues of Diana to have in your home to worship, they were going out of business. How's that happening? Because the church is a viral infection in Ephesus, as it's always intended to be. You can't snuff it out. And so they're serving people and people are coming to Christ and they're, they're burning their old pagan books and pagan scrolls and these, they're, they're lighting these things on fire. Christ is taking over the town. The people were hearing the gospel. They're being ministered to. They're seeing Christ in the works of these Ephesian believers and how they care for their community and love the people there. And that's all stopped. The church is pure in its doctrine, but nobody's getting saved. Nobody's being a part of the body now. They've fallen out of love with people. Again, their love is not on something else. They've lost love. When a church, Moundsville, listen to this. When a church is enduring persecutions and difficulties and trials, our natural tendency is going to be to turn inward in self-preservation in constant introspection in order to protect ourselves so that we don't get eliminated. So the worse the culture around us becomes, the more we build the walls and huddle up. That's how we talk about the rapture. We talk about it like, I just can't wait for God to get me off this, you know, junkyard of a planet. So let's just wait here, double down, make sure we're right. They can all, they can all go to hell. I don't care what happens to those people. They're evil anyway. They're gonna get what they deserve. We're staying faithful. We're staying true, right? You've heard fundamentalist sermons, I'm sure. That's what they sound like, right? That will be the tendency. When we get afraid, the defenses come up. When we feel threatened, we get nervous. And so it all becomes about 
protecting the house. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. I didn't put you there to last. I didn't put you there to last. The legacy is my gospel. It will be there whether you are or not. But you're alive at the same time the other people in Ephesus that are alive right now are alive. That's what you're there for. I'll worry about the preservation. You worry about serving other people. You need to return to the works you did at first. They aren't serving other people anymore. They aren't loving others anymore. And Jesus says, if you refuse to repent of this, meaning it's sinful, it's not mere oversight. It's not like if we enact this program, we'll solve this problem. No, 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 this is sinfulness. It's sinfulness. The, the, the more we become passionate about calling out other people's sin, the more ignorant we will be of our own. You need to return to the works you did at first. And if you refuse to do that, if you refuse to repent, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand. And Jesus is telling them because he remembers who they used to be. He knows who they used to be. If I put out your lampstand, your ability to be a light in this community is over. It's done for. So beloved, we can be doctrinally sound, dotting all our I's, crossing all our T's, and Jesus may still come to us in judgment and remove our lampstand. It's amazing. That's an amazing thought. He doesn't tell them, he's not telling them, look, doctrine doesn't matter. It divides, it's stuffy, it, it, it don't focus on that. No, 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 that's not what he's saying. He's saying there are two things that I want from you and you're only doing one. What he's saying is that if doctrine, if whatever you're teaching no matter how sound it is, doesn't result in the love of Christ being spread to others, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. Somewhere something is missing in their doctrine because it has affected their love. Right doctrine will not only be accurate, it will make us into who Christ is for sinners. That's part of doctrine. Jesus says, remember what you used to do, repent for not doing it, and start doing it again. Remember, they're not, he's, not thre he's not threatening them with their salvation. If you don't do this, you're going to lose your salvation. No, no, no. If you don't do this, I'm going to make sure you can't be a church that represents me. Because if you're not going to do that, you're not representing me. You're muddying the water, and I don't want that. If they don't, Remember, repent, and start loving people again. He'll come to them, he says that, and remove their lampstand. This coming is not the second coming at the end of all things. This, Jesus is speaking of coming to a church in preliminary judgment of that church for its unrepentance and its lack of faithfulness. It's a coming of discipline, right, for persisting in their lack of love and unrepentance that Jesus says will snuff out a church's light entirely in a community. When we hear that, understand that part of what Jesus is doing is trying to make the church realize we are in such a constant state of need for his mercy that we couldn't ever, if we were thinking correctly, if we were faithful, forget that sinners are in need of the gospel that has saved us. Jesus talks to his church like, if I don't save you, you aren't getting saved. If you're not reflecting who I am, you're not a church. I'll come and remove your lampstand. I don't want you representing me if this is how you're going to treat the people I've placed you in. Beloved, I can't emphasize this enough. In the book of Acts, chapter 17, I believe, you have been sent to Moundsville. You are missionaries here, literally. That's why we're here. We have the neighbors we have. We live on the streets that we do. We work in the places we do. We go to the places we frequent because God has sent us here for the sake of the people that will be groping in the darkness, not knowing what they're looking for, but realizing they need something. That's why we're here. We think that we pick the place we like and it's comfortable for us and that's where we want to live. And sure, that's a part of it from this perspective, 
But God has sent us, you and I are sent people. Right? Missionaries are not just those that go over the ocean. It's, it's every believer on the planet. Again, that's not a slogan. That's not what it is. We're all missionaries. Then be one. What do missionaries do when they move to Indonesia if they don't know the language and don't understand the currency and don't understand the culture? They learn it. Why? So they can speak the gospel into it. We become so comfortable where we are, it's like we're a part of the system rather than a sphere of light or a sliver of light being pushed into it. We're not a part of the system. This is not our home. This, we, this is not our home. This is the place we live. This is our airplane seat from here to glory. That's what this is. Jesus says, you can't forget that. You, if, if you forget that, you, you can keep the building open again. Like say, you can keep the lights on. You can keep paying the bills. You can keep having programs. It's not my light. You'll just be another nice building in your community. Jesus is serious. He doesn't play. That's how solid his salvation is. That's why it's so solid and so sure and it can't be lost because we have a mission to which we must give everything. This is the awareness that keeps our light on. Understanding what Christ has done for us and how that is meant to spread beyond us. Again, if, if all the talk of quarantine lately, if, if all the Christians quarantine in the church, the community won't get the virus. This virus, we want everybody to get. It's contagious. That's the way it was designed in the lab of God's almighty grace. But the end of this letter, notice this because these are his people. It's not a threat. It's a promise. Look at verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To all of them. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The one who conquers in context in Revelation 2 is the one who remembers, repents, and does the works they did at first. That's what it means to conquer in the midst of suffering and under threats while refusing to compromise on doctrine and instead keep, or, or in addition to that, the ones who keep cultivating affections for others that come out in genuine acts of love towards others. We're so married to our political hopes that we see the people on the other side of these hopes as our enemies and so we want to keep them at arm's length and not go to them, beloved, we have an obligation to them. Paul says in Romans 1, an obligation. We, we are going to the new heavens and the new earth for free because of Jesus. We have nothing to brag about, nothing to cling to and hold on like it's ours and you can't have it. Right? We're, we're, in that sense, we're not like children when you give them a present. It's mine, 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 and they're not going to share. And it was a gift, right? To such conquerors, those who repent and love others, Jesus will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. This is the first time in the New Testament this language comes out in the book of Revelation. That's what we lost in Genesis 3. Access to the tree of life in the paradise of God. You remember this. That's what we lost and could never access again. Now that painful memory in light of Jesus is transformed into hope that we will return to that tree and we will eat of its fruit. The promise here in 2.7 points to the tree of life in the new Jerusalem that in Revelation 22, 1 and 2 bears a different fruit every month for the healing of the nations. The temple of Diana or of Artemis was actually built in Ephesus on the site of this ancient tree shrine. The image of the date palm in ancient Ephesus symbolized the goddess. It symbolized her great city, Ephesus. In verse 7 for Ephesus, Jesus reveals that he outshines and excels the goddess Artemis and her tree. The tree on which Jesus died 
in a sense, becomes the tree of life that yields endless joy and eternal life for those who conquer by seeking God's mercy for their lack and refusing by his grace to stop loving others. The church of Jesus Christ cannot turn inwardly and forget the call to love others because we feel so threatened. I mean, how, how relevant is the word of God by the spirit who speaks to the churches, who's speaking to us tonight? We're under threat. If, if we can't see that, I, I can't help you. We need to be very careful as believers in how we are evaluating all this information coming at us that changes all the time and what's going on behind closed doors in secret or they think it's in secret in the government and among world leaders. Beloved, the threat is going to increase. The fear is going to rise. We cannot turn inwardly and forget our calling to love other people. The very people who are going to be threatening us the very people who are going to be threatening us. It is amazing when you read church history, how public opinion was swayed so hard and so quick. How could people gather in a Colosseum and watch Christians be eaten by lions? Right. How did that happen? Well, you sway public opinion and they didn't have the internet and the media and they did it. You can make these Christians think about how they talk about us. We're the unvaccinated. We're the ones who don't care. We're the ones who cling to our guns and our Bibles, right? It's coming. It's coming. And I don't know what form it will take. And I don't know if this is the end. Just because it's changing in America doesn't mean it's the end, but it certainly could be. But beloved, we, we, this is not the time to double down. This is the time to let go. This is, this is the prime time ground for mission in Moundsville, in the Ohio Valley, when the threat rises. Who are these people filled with hope? Why are you loving me? I hate you. I hate everything you, we think that, that you fight fire with fire. You don't fight fire with fire. You fight it with grace. Jesus Again, we're not talking about love at the expense of right doctrine. That's the straw man. Oh, we're just going to love everybody and not care about the truth? No. That would be bad doctrine. No, we're, this is not love at the expense of right doctrine. That's not what Jesus calls his church to. This is love that flows naturally out of right doctrine, or it's not right enough. Right? Or it's not right enough. Something is missing if love for people isn't increasing. Jesus doesn't tell them to stop focusing on doctrine. Do you notice that? He doesn't say, you got to stop focusing on the truth and start focusing on love. They're not mutually exclusive things. He doesn't tell them to stop focusing on doctrine. He, he's telling them, remember, you who are so precise, that precise, accurate doctrine results in love for other people. It includes loving imperfect people and sinners and your community. So, in our pursuit of doctrinal and spiritual integrity in the midst of an unbelieving and increasingly immoral culture, we must not ignore the voice of Jesus who commands us to love both our neighbors that we like and our enemies that we don't. This is the first way the church conquers in the last days in the sense of how these Letters are written. We conquer the temptation to stop loving people even in the midst of their rampant wickedness. This kind of love is only cultivated through a pure and biblical gospel. When we do not love others, what has happened is we've forgotten how much Christ loves us when he shouldn't. That's what's at issue here. If we forget the gospel, we can't be the church. If we forget that we're panhandlers here on the streets of God's city, if we forget that we're the last and the least, 
if we forget that we have this obligation to these people who threaten our freedom, is our lampstand going to get taken away? Are we just going to exist? Can I say something to you a little scary? Okay. Beloved, do all of you realize that our church as it stands today has about a 10 year shelf life? You realize that? Most of the people holding us up will be gone in that amount of time. What happens to us then? What are we trying to ensure and make sure it doesn't get forgotten? What is it? What is it? Right, where, where are we going to be in a decade? Jacob and I were talking earlier this week. I want you to think about something for a minute. I know we're just inundated with homosexuality and LGBTQ and transgender type. I, I, I understand that. And, and I, like, I want you to think about something. In about 10 years or so, 15 years, imagine how all the people that have been broken by many of these things are going to be despondent and it didn't work and it didn't get what they thought it would get them, they're going to be groping in the darkness. Are we going to be there to help them heal? Beloved, homosexuality is a sin. Stealing is a sin. Murder is a sin. We don't deny that for a second. If we do, we're antichrist, we're against the word. We're not denying it. But would somebody who was gay feel like they could come here and listen without being stoned to death. I don't want them coming in here. Then what are you doing here? We're not talking about telling them it's okay how you are. It's totally, no, we're not going to tell people that. That's a sin. You need to repent of that. But beloved, if they can't come here and listen to the gospel, where are they going to go? Because we're not going to them, right? We couldn't be seen sitting at a table with some friends who are gay, having a nice dinner together. Everybody would think, well, what's up with them? Then you'd be like Jesus. Like, beloved, it, it's, it, uh, that issue comes to mind because it's, it's just, like I said, it's just such a big, it's everywhere. You know, you're, you're just, I, look, I never thought I would walk into a hair salon, which <laughs> I still have to get it. Before I bought my Freedom Groomer, I had to get it shaved. So, but I know this is going to sound funny. I'm not trying to make fun of this guy and I don't, that's not what I mean. But in California, it's California. Like, like you just expected that it was, it's California. So I didn't think I'd walk into a hair place in West Virginia and hear that kind of talk, you know, like, like this is, sounds so horrible. And that, you know, you just, you don't think you would hear like gay people talking in the way that culture tends to sound and what they talk about. You don't think you'd find that in West Virginia, right? Not because West Virginia's, I'm telling you the rest of the country doesn't think you're dumb. Okay. I know that that's a horrible stereotype of our city and our, our state and all that. But I mean, it's most people don't, they're thinking of like the West Virginia that's in like the cabin in the woods movie or something like, you know, they're not, most people don't even think about it, but you think of this place as a conservative place, right? Not really like it's more, we're kind of insulated here and protected. And in many ways, I'm very happy for that. But beloved, do you know how many kids at the high school are in the throes of this? I mean, I mean, how, how many how many kids are struggling with this? How, how many kids are struggling with sexual issues anyway? I mean, you have heterosexual fornication is just as big, if not a bigger problem for our young people as homosexuality is. It's just sin is everywhere, but Christ is everywhere, right? Beloved, they're, they're, they're not our enemies. They're not our enemies. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. They're not our enemies. They're the point, all right? Like we are the point. Because if God doesn't reach down and wake us up and raise us from the dead, we're right where they are, whether we're sinning in the same way or not. So those are, this is how it happens. This is what he's talking about. You have become so fixated on this doctrine that, for example, this is a sin. Correct. True. Biblical. No compromise. Right? I hope that's clear. That's not what I'm talking about. You've become so fixated on it that you've forgotten it's not a means to hate and, you know, ostracizing people. It's, it's there they are. Serve them. Serve them. Right? So if, if we walk out of here tonight, oh great, Pastor Tony's going to bring in a whole bunch of gays. What? I mean, look, if, if, we, if, if, if a bunch of people came in here that had those struggles to hear the gospel, I'd be thrilled. I'd be thrilled. 
right? We're not going to condone somebody's sin, but you ever thought about what's behind that question? We condone your sin all the time. All the time. We condone each other's sin, but that one is gross. So it's said, right? So we don't want them in here. What? That's who gets in. It depends on how you're sinning. That's what depends on who gets in your church. You know how many of us gossip and how many of the rest of us laugh at it and act like it's normal? We just condone sin all the time. These are the things we forget that Jesus would have us remember and repent for our attitudes and return. It's beloved immorality, blatant immorality is not the only kind of sin. It may be more immediately destructive, absolutely, but there's also forgetting people that is so serious in the eyes of our gracious Savior that he says, if you don't stop it and repent, I'll come to you and I'll snuff out your light because you're not going to bear my name if you're not going to act like me. That's all I'm telling you, beloved. And I, I don't mean to harp on that one thing. I don't, that's not the point of it. I'm saying that, like I said, it's, it's just part of it. So, we're so inundated with it. And it just, rather than it making us angry at people, like the BLM stuff or the, where you just get so mad at people. No, 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 no. They need Jesus and we have him. Right? It, it's, we can't lose sight of how he loves us. So doctrine is a means to an end the end for which God created the world, which is the salvation of people from every tribe, language, tongue, and nation. Everything in the church serves the mission, even the voice of Jesus to us. If we forget that, we lose our lampstand. So beloved, tonight, as you ask the Holy Spirit to move in your heart, do we need to repent of any unloving spirits? of any unloving actions and return to love as God defines it. Not love at the expense of truth, but love with all of the truth. Right? I, I, I don't mean to imply that we'll only know we're doing that when our church is filled with, you know, any and every kind of sinner. I, I, I hope that happens. It may not. I simply mean Can we return to love as God defines it for the Ohio Valley and then let Jesus worry about the results and how it looks, right? This is the right doctrine that bears the fruit of love, the gospel, beloved. This is the voice of Jesus to the church.